Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. You know, every once in a while when I do a, a, a message, I have what in my content, in my spirit, but I don't really know how to set it up. And you'll come in and you'll be in the service and you'll be in worship. Uh, and by the way, that's a key. If you teach, it's, I, a lot of times with guest speakers, you'll see them and they'll be, everybody will be worshiping and they'll be like reviewing their notes. And I thought, man, I'm not trusting my notes. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit. If there's worship, you know, I already gave it time. I just need to connect with Jesus and worship so that when I stand up there, I'm not trusting. I reviewed it one more time, right? So that's a wisdom key right there. But every once in a while when you're uh, not quite sure how to segue into what you want to say, somebody will say prophetically or on the worship team, they'll drop a bomb or a statement. I'm like, oh, my God, he just set me up, right? Well, I love that because that makes for a seamless service, and it also lets you know that God orchestrated everything, right? So Donnie said something awesome I want to build on. He said, you know, no prophetic act to the flesh or any prophetic act in the flesh is going to appear foolish, right? Because the natural man receives not things of God, neither can he know them because they're foolishness to him. Well, when we're in the flesh, sometimes we think spiritual things look a little foolish, right? And we have to be in the spirit and embrace by the spirit spiritual things. So um, to give you an example, Sandra and I were in a meeting, of, I don't know, a couple of months ago, I, I guess. And there's somebody that we admired that we believe moved in miracle signs and wonders. And uh, he's a worshiper. So we were expecting, uh, you know, some really uh, some amazing worship. But he walks out and he goes, well, I didn't bring my keyboard and I, you know, I don't have any musicians and I don't have any instruments. So we're just going to have to kind of do this thing uh, a cappella, you know, as the Lord leads. So I'm like, OK, you know, it's not what I expected, but I'm in. And then he goes, I'm making room for the glory I'm making and I'm like are you kidding I'm like you know you ever been like there's the mild temptation to be embarrassed on somebody's behalf but then you know this man this guy's a man of power and you should just like so Sandra and like we're making room for the glory and we're we're in right but really when we got in the car we were like was that weird? Was, was that weird to you? And we got down the road and God began to speak with us. And he said, look, there's something coming that I need you to prepare for. I need you to make room for the glory. And all of a sudden I got really convicted because we have filters of what we think would be appropriate behavior in church. And God uses outlandish things to speak to the hearts of people. And we cannot afford to let our flesh filters cause us to miss the prophetic word of God. So we kind of repented after that because we, it set us on a trail or on a course of self-examination to find out what does it mean to make room for the glory, right? So I'm not, I didn't prepare a message to come and say, now this is what's going on. no. When usually when we give messages, we just Sandra and I would just share. Well, this is our journey. I don't know where you guys are at, but maybe if this is our journey and the way God is leading us, maybe it will bless you. Maybe He's got you on a similar track. Is that okay? Okay. So we know that we 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 need to make room for the glory, and then uh, so we have that in our hearts. Uh, I'm watching. I, you know, when you have a four-year-old, you don't get a chance to watch TV very much anymore, right? It's all Sophia the First or something like that, and just like, oh, my God. So I'm begging Sandra, can I just have a man day where I can watch TV and see something manly? <laughs> so I had a little window, and I'm flipping through Netflix, and I find a program I haven't seen more that looks like it's going to be exactly what I want. It's called Ghost Town Gold, Right? And it's a bunch of cowboy guys, and, and, and they're, they're pickers. They're collectors. And they go around to different ghost towns, mining towns. And then they, they go into these places and said, we got a lot of money. We buy old stuff. 
uh, would you let us into your barn? And uh, they'd say, well, let me see that you got money first because I don't want to look you lose. And, oh, no, we got money. Okay, come on. And they go in there and, well, what would you want for this? And what would you want for that? Now, but these guys are crazy. They go and they crawl under the house and look for things. They go into the basements and the cellars. They crawl up into the attic and they wade through trash laden with rat dung to find the treasure that everybody forgot about. And it's really kind of fun, right? But as I'm watching it, I'm watching it, well, not that part, but <laughs> the, 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 the recovery part, right? Because <clears throat> they make money. What they do is they buy it, and at the end of the show, said, I pay 20 bucks for this, I'm going to sell it for 60, and then they add up all the things, and it said, hey, we had a good day, I made about 600 bucks, right? And then they, they got people that they pick for that say, anything you got, bring a buy, I'll buy it. I'm watching the show. The guy's up in the attic. He's got a dust mask on. It doesn't look like a place you'd want to be. And God starts dealing with me and said, I want you to go into the attic and the basement and under the house of your soul and let, let me show you some things that need to go away to make room for my glory. I'm like, oh, okay. So we're like, okay, what, what does that mean? So now we're on the same page. We're, we're reading things in the Word. We have a love affair with the Passion Translation right now. It's like reading the Bible for the first time again. Oh, my God, are we getting, getting stuff from God? He's really talking to us. So we're getting stuff, and we're sharing with each other, and it's like we need to make room for the glory. So we've been to some meetings. We've read some books. We've learned some things about the fact that we've got rooms in our soul, right? We're three-part being. Uh, we are a spirit. We have a, a soul. We live in a body. Right, And we, we used to think, well, those are the only gateways or access points for the enemy. Uh, the temple had that, but it had all these storage rooms that went around it, too, where they kept the vestments of the priests and various other elements. And if you read in the book of Nehemiah, you find out some bad stuff was done with those closets, right? You ever hear the term, you got skeletons in your closet? I'm sure that's where it came from, right there. So we can be believers. We got, we're believers. We love the Lord. We're growing in grace and knowledge and stuff, but we have uh, something in the basement we didn't even know was there or something that we haven't dealt with and God wants us to make room for the glory there's a move of God that's coming that's going to eclipse the book of Acts you realize that but it's going to be for the ready the prepared right you know in Joel 2 it says the day's coming when God's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh and we're all going hey maybe right because I was reading, I believe it was in Jeremiah or Ezekiel, I don't remember now, but there were some people that were around the prophet of God when the angel of the Lord showed up. And the prophet fell down and worshipped. But all of his companions ran in fear because they all began to tremble and shake. And God showed me, when the glory comes, when it hits, when the revival comes, when the wave, the tsunami wave comes, there's going to be worshippers and runners in the body of Christ. Because the runners were, un, were not preparing making room for the glory of God, right? So we as believers, we have, we're in a season right now that's very uncomfortable. I don't know if you've noticed, right? There are more people that we love and know and people in ministry that are going through stuff and pastors are even committing suicide and we see this in the news. And people are like, what is going on? Well, the Bible says judgment begins at the house of God. How's God going to judge the earth if his church is out of line, Right? So he's, if revival's come, the reason we know revival is coming is because he's judging his church. And that's not a bad thing in a sense, like, because we've been redeemed from the curse, the judgment curse. But areas in our soul are access points for the enemy. There's some buy-ins in our life where we have agreed with lies from the devil that give him access to our life. And God says, I want truth to go into those places and drive out the darkness. Then when the glory comes, you'll be wide open. There'll be nothing for you to be embarrassed about or, or convicted about. You know, because Adam ran when God showed up. Because he wasn't prepared. Right? He didn't make room for the glory. So Sandra and I have been working this out. And we were asking ourselves, driving in the car, was it yesterday or very, very recently, we're driving together in the car. And I said, okay, if God wants us to clean rooms... If there are, are, are areas in our life where we have opened ourselves up for oppression, because Jesus died for us to live the abundant life, right? If, the, if you're doing a great work for God and the enemy's oppressing you, yeah, you can say, well, I'm getting persecution for righteousness' sake. 
But the Bible really says, like in Psalm 94, that we can live a bulletproof life, right? If we're in the will of God and we've dealt with all our stuff, we, the devil circles you. The Bible says he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That means he can't devour everybody. So who is it that he can seek? Somebody that has a little dark area in their soul that gives the enemy a, you know, a buy-in with the lies of the devil that can give them access and torment them in that area. So Sandra and I are, are, are kind of going down the list and things, and I said, what are you feeling like? They said, oh, you know, like a, a spirit of heaviness and sometimes uh, unusual fatigue. Even sometimes when we open our Bible, you know, we're wide awake. We wake up in the morning. Oh, I'm going to read my Bible. And we opened up and we start to fall asleep. It's like, no, that's fatigue in Jesus' name. That's not natural. I rebuke it. I command it to go, right? So we're investigating those areas. And once she shared that and we're in the car, I kid you not, I'm going to tell you what, what I said in the car yesterday. It was supernatural. So I said, Sandra, what we got to do is we got to first recognize, right? Then we need to repent if we've given access to the enemy. Then we need to renounce. Then we need to rebuke, reclaim, rededicate, and restore. And I just said that. I didn't, wasn't reading it. It just came out of my spirit. And she goes, get a pencil. Write it down, right? So I thought, wow, that, that, that's tweetable. That, that's God right there. I'm going to. So. I wrote it down, but then I began to pray about it and explore it, and I realized that th th those were divine instructions for Sandra and I on the journey that we're on right now and preparing for the glory. Put recognize. Oh, you put them all up? Okay. Well, let's start with recognize. I looked all these up and plus formulated my own opinions what I believe God is saying to me in this area. Recognize means to identify and acknowledge the existence of something, to identify the validity or the legality of something, to come to a place where you admit, accept, confess, or own up to something that you allowed. It's usually a deception that you believe that leads you to wrong thinking or wrong behavior. So the first step in making room for the glory is you got to get along with God. You got to get quiet. You got to soak. You got to get on your face or maybe come to a reveal night or something like that and just say, Lord, I only really need to know the first step. We'll get to the other things. But right now, I just need a reveal. I just need a revelation of what it is that I have bought into that isn't true, that is giving the enemy access to my life in this area. And it doesn't have to be a major thing. It could be you know, Sandra and I were probably not the best financial stewards that we could be for all of the promise of abundance and prosperity that we've received, right? And so if there's something there, I want to challenge it and I want to remove it so that the glory has access to that area of my life. Some of you that have chronic sicknesses and you go to the doctors and they check you out and they can't find anything, it's spiritual, right? Don't freak out right? You know, if the doctor comes and checks you out and shows you an x-ray of a tumor, well, yeah, you need prayer, right? But if they can't find anything, do the math. It's not there. It's, it's the lie of the devil. Now, I'm not talking about, I, I, there's pain, there's torment. I'm not saying that, that it's not there. I'm just saying that doctors are not going to fix the problem. Jesus is going to fix the problem, right? The power of prayer and the agreement of your brothers and sisters is the answer to that problem, right? But also you need prophetic revelation to reveal to you what the buy-in is in that situation that allowed that to occur in your life. Because it's not the will of God, right? We need to find out, first of all, what is the will of God and find out what am I in agreement with that has allowed this to occur, right? Right? Now, Sandra and I have been under pressure in different areas, but we recognize that God is revealing things in order for us to confront things, right? And I'm having a lot of dreams, so I'm an old man, I guess, because in Joel 2, it said old man will dream dreams, but uh, too late for visions, I guess, right? <laughs> so anyway, I have this dream, 
And in my dream, my thumb is all swollen. And forgive me, this is a terrible image, but I squeezed it and all this stuff came out of it. And I woke up like, what was that? Right? He says, there's stuff in you that's got to come out. Right? You got to make room for the glory. I, I can't have you. We all need to nail, listen to me, because it's a metaphor, you'll miss it. We all need to nail our Achilles heel to the cross. You know what I'm saying? The area of your weakness, that area where the enemy keeps hitting you in that zone and you know it's because of you. We all say, oh, persecution for righteousness. No, you got stuff, right? And we need to deal with it, right? Now, I'm telling you right now, it's like most of you got stuff. We all got stuff, right? All of us, right? So God's saying, I'm making room for the glory. Oh, did that hurt? Let me show you why. This is what you need to deal with. This. So we need to deconstruct the lies of the enemy. After you recognize, you must repent. Repentance is to have remorse or a conviction that will lead you to a change. Now, a lot of us, we have stuff. And it's not the stuff that we got. They are hindrances, right? Uh, they are, can be obsessive, right? Constantly plaguing us and distracting us from the thing that God wants us to get to. Those all have to be recognized and identified. And sometimes we recognize and we identify it. And for some reason, and it's not smart, but I've been there. We recognize it, but we still won't give it to God. We don't want to deal with it yet. Give me a couple of weeks. I'll pray about it. It's telling God you'll pray about it, right? No, at some, but you know what happens? It will escalate. And as it escalates, you will come to a place where you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, and you'll be willing to do whatever it is you need to do to get past that thing, right? It's a good place. I'm telling you, a lot of us, oh, you know, and I don't want to judge people. You know, my heart breaks for, like, you hear the news about pastors committing suicide. I understand the pressure. I really do. The pressure is real. But what if you're just in process and you're just a little bit away from breakthrough or maybe you're holding on to a deception that God wants to break with prophetic revelation. It's just going to completely set you free, right? That's where endurance comes in. That's where faith comes in. But it's also where you slow down and say, okay, this is the one thing right now for me to untangle myself from the deceptions that were wrapped around me from the time I was a child, right? Repent to have remorse or conviction that leads to a change, a complete turnaround. Your conviction must be met with confession and declaration. That's how we got saved, right? You got to put a voice to it. Lord, I confess that thing is a sin. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And you said you would do that in your word. And that's not after three days of feeling sorry for myself. That's right now when I get off my knees. And you move on. Right? Because your identity didn't change because you made a mistake. You're still a glorious child of God with a great destiny who had a oopsie. Okay? Get over it. Shake it off. The enemy wants you to wallow in pain and grief and sorrow. And none of that is from God. That's self-made torture, right? Confess your sins, repent, and he will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. It's right there, right? I remember Brother Copeland was teaching on this, and he, he did something stupid. He didn't say what it was, but he was supposed to go preach that night, and he said, Lord, you need to find another man. Well, I said, why? Well, you know why, Lord. We said, well, did you repent? Well, yes, I did. Did I say that I would clean you, uh, cleanse you from all unrighteousness? Well, yeah. Well, what's the problem? I, I would appreciate it. You keep bringing that thing up over and over again because I've already dealt with it. You repented. I cleansed. Move on. Go preach, right? The devil keeps us in a ditch, but it's not God, right? Okay. So repentance leads to a change of mind, a reversal, a, co a complete, really, a 180 is, that, is the Greek translation. You turn around, you go the other way. 
your confession and your declaration, uh, God is what you say to God and the courtroom of heaven. Because you have a prosecuting attorney called the devil. He's the accuser of the brethren. And he wants to keep you in that self-pity and that give up spirit. He wants the ultimate goal of suicide. Right? Self-hatred. But you confess your sins and in the courtroom in heaven, you got Jesus, your Lord, your advocate. And you're saying, you know, I, I'm trusting in the blood. I, I recognize I missed it and I'm not all that. Right? But you're all that and you paid the price for me. So that's my defense in the court of heaven. And the father, the judge, will look to Jesus. Is that true? Yeah. He, he prayed and asked me to be Lord of his life. Case dismissed. It's over. The devil's got nothing. There's no accusation there. There's now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Man, you walk out of that courtroom like you are restored to the pre-fall dominion of Adam, praise God, because the devil's got nothing on you. But he's got deception. That's why Paul said, don't give place to the devil. That's why we stay in the word. That's why we meditate on the word day and night. Because when the devil speaks something that is deception, if you've got the word in your heart, you're like, have you not read 1 John 1, 9? You know, you're putting it back on him. What does it say? He who knew no sin became sin for us and made us the very righteousness of God. That's a gift. Right standing with God is a gift. Your oopsie can't separate you from the love of God. Right? Now, uh, unrepented sin can't. But how hard is it to go, oops, I missed it. Please forgive me, Jesus. I'm putting my trust in your blood, and it's done. That's pretty cool. That's a good deal. You know what the gospel's called? Good news. Anybody besides me think that's good news? That you can ask for forgiveness and get it, and you don't have to wait for it? Come on. That's an awesome deal. So when you confess in the courtroom of heaven, it opens up the floodgate of grace and forgiveness and positions your sins under the blood of Jesus and the devil's got nothing. It's case dismissed. After recog uh, you recognize and repent, now you have to renounce because you have to recognize that you missed it because you bought into something that wasn't true, right? And renunciation is to formally declare your complete abandonment of your enemy's claim upon your life. I love that. You know, one, once you repent, you're in right standing with God. There's nothing the devil can grab a hold of, right? Uh, he, you deny his right of possession. And I'm not just talking about ah, the demon possession. I'm talking you deny his right to be involved in trying to possess your finances, your marriage, your children, right? Uh your destiny, your doors of opportunity, your favor with God and man. Devil, get your hands off that stuff. I have right standing with God. You are a claim jumper, and you're exposed. I expose you, and I renounce you. I don't want you to be any, have anything to do in my life. I don't want to hear your voice. Don't even whisper. Stay away from me. Yes, I thought that was God, that other stuff that you were telling me before that took me down into a ditch, but now I realize it's a lie and I renounce it. I'm not going back to that nonsense. Is there anybody that was studying and seeking truth and maybe like me waded through a little bit of philosophy and some new age teaching and things and then found Jesus and realized he's the way, the truth, and the life and had an encounter? Did anybody after that go back to philosophy? I know I sure didn't. Oh, my God, why once, once something's exposed to be false, why would you ever go back to it? Yeah. Repenting is, is saying, I missed it, I'm going the other way. Renouncing is saying, I, I confront every false claim of the devil's involvement in my life because I have renounced the lie that put me through hell. Then you rebuke. Because after you recognize, repent, and renounce, you are restored to full authority. Now, you got sin in your life, you try to cast the devil out of somebody, good luck with that. Right? Now, I'm talking unrepentant sin. Right? Because you get right with God, and he'll, he'll operate through you because he loves the person that's bound, and he'll use anybody that's willing. Right? 
But the sons of Sceva didn't have no relationship with Jesus, and they said, we adjure you in the name of this Jesus that this other guy Paul somewhere was talking about. And no, that's not going to make it happen. They got whooped up on, if you know your scriptures, right? But when you recognize, repent, and renounce, now you have authority to rebuke, not just your torments, but to get now involved because you're learning some things to get involved in other people's life that you see are bound and rebuke spirits off of people. Come off them in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for light to break into and destroy the deception that gives that devil what he thinks is permission to torment their life. Right? You rebuke. You rebuke the legality of access. You show him from the word that he's a trespasser and you rebuke him and command him to go. You declare as a trespass with authority and confidence because of your realignment with God's will. And you don't have to be perfectly realigned. It's more of a heart thing. If God sees that you're following the breadcrumbs of intimacy and realignment with him, even if you're not all the way there, he's looking at your intent, not at the actual geography of where you are in that process. Right? It's when you know and you're like, yeah, mm, you know, that it, you can get into trouble. But remember, in process, all trouble leads you back to recognize, repent, renounce, rebuke, right? So God uses everything. All things work to the good to them that love God, those called according to his purpose, right? Okay, I got to go through a few more because I'm getting close. After you rebuke, you reclaim. Reclaim. It means to evict and repossess the recovered territories of God and completely cleanse from all of the vestiges of wrongdoing. When they found, uh, in the book of Nehemiah, they found that Tobiah had set up a stronghold in the, on the side of the temple where the storage was, where they kept the tithes and offerings. Man, if you're struggling with tithes and offerings, you probably got a little spirit named Tobiah that got into your storehouse of thinking and is trying to convince you that he has a right to be there, but he doesn't. Do what Nehemiah did. They kicked him out. They threw all of his stuff out. They cleansed the room and rededicated it to God and put what belonged to God back in there. And then they defended it. So reclaiming is kicking the claim jumper off your claim. Then you rededicate. You put the space on the altar, the space, because here's the danger. You kick Tobiah out, you clean it all up, and you make it real nice, and then you start thinking, oh, I could put the TV over there, and you start thinking that that space is somehow for your personal use. No, if God kicks the devil out of a space, it's because he wants that space, right? And he wants it for his glory, right? Well, there's no better thing you can put in an empty room but the glory of God. Why would you wrestle with God over that? But people do, unfortunately. You know, we see in the Bible that they cast a, a devil out of a person, and he went away, but he didn't put the Holy Spirit in place of, in that room, that house that was swept and clean, and seven more devils came back that were more nasty than the first one, and the end of that man was worse than the first, Right? So if you ever go for deliverance, make sure you're fully committed to not only clean the house, but fill it with the Holy Spirit, right? Or spirits come back and mess with you again, right? Is this too much for you guys? You good with this? Okay. Okay. Rededicate. Put that space on the altar of God's will in order to restore to God's intended purpose. And then restore. You've got the room clean. You've got it dedicated. You're good to give it with God, and then you go into a place and you invite the Holy Spirit to come and take up residence where once an unclean spirit had access. You say, Holy Spirit, come and occupy your rightful place in the area of my soul that I have now dedicated to the service of God. That's what it means to make room for the glory. Give no place to the devil. And if he's had historically place in your life, it's time for that season with God where he reveals things to you about what need to be dealt with. Don't 
cower back from it. God's just trying to get you to the fullness of Christ, the blessings of, of the glory. The manifest presence of God is the most glorious thing that you could ever experience unless you have unsurrendered rooms. Then it's an uncomfortable experience, right? So God is giving everybody an opportunity to go, Lord, what do I need to recognize? I'm going to set some time aside today to pray with you. And you know what? Maybe I don't know what I got. Do you know there were 90 storerooms on the side of the temple? That's a lot of hiding places, right? And so let's just say, hypothetically speaking, I've got 10 things I need to deal with. God's not going to open up 10 doors and freak you out with 10 things. He's going to give you grace for the nine, but you're not going to be able to move forward. unless. Okay, let's just talk about the one. Let's talk about the root of your anger. Remember when this happened, you need to give that to me. You need to renounce, repent, do whatever it is, whatever God leads you to do. Sozo, right? But once you get that done and the Holy Ghost goes into that place, it's going to be such an amazing progressive experience for you that you're like, oh, let's go check some other rooms out. Let's crawl up into the attic and see what's up there. I'd never gone up there because I was afraid to, afraid what I might find. Well, with the Holy Ghost on your side, there's no fear. And going and allowing the lover of your soul to show you things that he wants to go away so he can take the place that was meant for him. Repentance is not what you say to God. No, excuse me. Repentance is what you say to God. Renunciation is what you say to the devil in front of God so that he knows you mean business. I was in a meeting and, and a prophet made a statement. He was talking about the courtroom of heaven. And he says, go to God and talk with him and make sure that there are no liens on your life. Well, I was a contractor, so I know what that means, right? If they don't like something that you do, they put a lien on your property, and you can't get paid, and you can't get away, and you're stuck. And the devil wants to put a lien on your life because of something over a legal situation, right? Okay. Go to God, find out what it's about, and then go with your advocate into the courtroom of heaven and deal with it. Amen? All right. Father, I just pray that you, that the entrance of the word of God would bring light in this area, Father. I pray that this would not just be a message, Lord, like seed thrown where the fowls of the air would come and steal it or go on stony ground. I just pray, Father, for a hundredfold return on revelations that are from the Spirit of God. Lord, let everybody take this to a point of activation in their life. And as breakthrough comes, Father, we will minister to others the same way of escape to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.